Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight, we have a very, very special guest, uh, former Massachusetts Senator John Kerry, former Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, the negotiator for the United States of the uh, climate uh, uh, accord that was, uh, that was negotiated in Paris, uh, just a, a seminal leader uh, on the issue of uh, clean energy uh, and uh, dealing fundamentally with the climate crisis that our planet has been faced with. So we're just so fortunate to be able to have this uh, conversation with, uh, with uh, Secretary Kerry uh, this evening. And, uh, and so we welcome you, John, uh, to, our, to our, uh, our, our digital world here that we've moved to uh, since the middle of March. And, uh, and I thought maybe we could start with, um, with maybe you reflecting upon uh, the Paris Accord uh, because it expires in the week of November 3rd uh, of uh, 2020. So it's on the ballot, this great agreement that you were able to negotiate and maybe you could talk a little bit about how high the stakes are. Well, Eddie, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and thank you for uh, inviting me to share a conversation with you. Secondly, uh, a huge congratulations to you on a tremendous primary win, which was the result of uh, your marshalling the forces of an incredible grassroots team who care about climate and care about uh, some other key issues. But most importantly, you just stuck it out and, and stood for a clarity about what you were campaigning for and what you've been doing. And I salute you for uh, a, a terrific, uh, campaign effort, very, really uh, high quality. Um, you've also been one of the longest advocates on this issue. I mean, you did that Marky Waxman bill and I tried to get that passed in the Senate. We got up to about 55 votes and then the Peabody Coal Company started to spend incredible sums of money to, to attack Lindsey Graham, who had been working with us on it. And that made Lindsey Graham pull out and shy away and different things happen. But you've been to the cops, you've been around the world, you've been uh, at this uh, as long as I have too. Uh, we go back to the 1970s and the early stages of doing all of this, first Earth Day, if you recall. Um, so let me pick up uh, on your question and sort of where we are, reflect on Paris a little bit. I, I had been, as you had been, to a number of the conference of the parties of the UN uh, I was in Kyoto, I was in Poland, and I mean, I can't, just there are too many places to list. But more recently, right before I became Secretary of State, when I was Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I was in Copenhagen, along with you and others, when it failed. We didn't get anywhere. President Obama was chasing through the halls of Copenhagen, trying to find President Xi and get a meeting, and it was a disaster. And um, But not a disaster, because we pulled out, or we weren't wanting it to be something because China then was leading the G77 countries against doing anything until the developed world did something. And you can understand their argument. 85% of all the emissions come from 20 countries. And so a lot of countries are sitting there and saying, hey, wait a minute, you're telling us we can't do this, we can't do that, but you're the guys who created this mess and you're not doing enough to deal with it. So when I became Secretary of State, I knew we did not have a prayer of getting an agreement in Paris that was meaningful unless we got China to change its position. And within six weeks of becoming Secretary, I went to China, I met with President Xi, negotiated with him, and we got the Chinese to sign on to a task force where we would take a year to develop what both of us could do to set an example to the world that we were serious and we needed to do something. One year later, President Obama and President Xi stood up in the Great Hall of the People, and we announced China and the United States' reductions that we were going to undertake in keeping with the idea of Paris. That lit the fire. And we were able to do great diplomacy, President Obama, uh, Vice President Biden, myself, our team, people like Brian Deese and John Podesta and Todd Stern. I mean, we had a great team of people. And we worked our butts off to bring other nations to the table so that when we went to Paris, we had a great building block that had been a foundation being created. 
And we were able to bring reluctant countries like Saudi Arabia or Brazil or Australia uh, or India. We brought them to the table through various mechanisms, but mostly just really sound and strong diplomacy, Eddie. And, and you guys in the house were doing a lot of that at the time um, and, and a key part of it. And, and so America was credible. America was in the game. America was really pushing to achieve something, even though they knew we had divisions ideologically in our country. Uh, Donald Trump comes in and he pulls out of Paris. Now, one thing I will say to everybody about Paris, we knew in Paris that we didn't have the ability to get a mandatory set of reductions. There were legal reasons we couldn't do that with the Senate because of treaties and we couldn't ever get the Senate to ratify it, so we'd never get moving. So we made an executive agreement and we uh, did it with the understanding that we weren't promising the world we actually had in hand the ability to hold the Earth's temperature increase to two degrees centigrade or 1.5, which was aspirational. We were promising that 196 countries were simultaneously, all of them, going to move in the same direction towards the Sustainable Development Goals, the ESG, and to do what we needed to do to hold the Earth's temperature to two degrees. And that meant money was going to flow, and it did into alternative renewable sustainable energy. So for the first time ever after Paris, two years in a row, more money went into alternative renewable sustainable energy than went into fossil fuel. First time that's ever happened. Trump pulls out and suddenly the reluctant countries that didn't really want to do much in the first place said, well, what? why do we have to do anything now? America's not doing it, they're not leading. And, and so thank God that our states and our communities, our, our municipalities, our cities, and the mayors in them, Marty Walsh in Boston and Jay Inslee, governor of Washington, these folks and uh, you know came to the table. I remember I was in New York uh, because I'd been part of the trying to stay, we're, we're staying with Paris movement. And we brought uh, Governor Cuomo, Governor Jerry Brown, Governor Inslee and myself did a press conference at which we announced Hey, Donald Trump may pull out, but America is going to stay in. And 38 states have renewable portfolio laws. A thousand plus cities are all working to do the things necessary to reduce emissions. So we're not far off. But, but today, and Eddie, you know this better than anybody. And I'll just wrap up on this. The, if we did everything that we promised we we're going to do in Paris, Regrettably, it's still, we're gonna see an increase to about 3.7 degrees centigrade on the Earth's temperature. We're not doing everything we promised to do in Paris. Therefore, we're actually on a curve to hit 4.1 to 4.5 degrees in this century. And you know, and most of your supporters know exactly what that means, which is why you've all been so motivated to say, we can't, we can't do this business as usual. We've got to change. This is existential. We'll have tens of millions of refugees. We'll have water drying up. We'll have food disruption. We already see the remarkable damage we're getting with the intensity of the storms and the changes taking place. And guess what? That's at a warming level of about 1.2 degrees. That's where we are now. We're not even at 1.5 and you see what the damage is. So reasonable people with any sense of science and evidence and the meaning of facts know that this is the great challenge for our world. And it happens to also be the greatest economic opportunity we've ever had to create millions of jobs, to transition to a virtuous energy economy, to be the leaders in the world in terms of technology, to have better health, less cancer, greater security in terms of America's external security in the world, all of these things come with responding to this. And you've been great, Eddie, in helping to frame the discussion in, in a smarter way and get us away from just, you know, the, the sort of tree hugging. Uh, I'm, not I'm, not, I'm not negative about it, but I'm just saying that it doesn't ring a bell with some of the people we have to persuade. So we we we, we still like tree hugging. We like Arbor Day. We want to hug the trees. I hug trees all the time, man. 
but we have to have a conversation that's going to persuade some of those people in West Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky and a lot of other places. And that just doesn't grab them. But jobs do and health does and the future uh, of their children does. And I think we've got a great argument to make. Yeah. So, you know, I, I agree with you. And, uh, you know, back in uh, 2007, when uh, I was the house author of the law that President Obama used to increase fuel economy standards uh, to 54.5 miles per gallon. Um, that's still the single largest reduction in greenhouse gases of any law ever passed in any country. But of course, we had to bring along uh, the auto industry. We had to make sure they understood that there was going to be a transition, that we would be helping them financially. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we were making great progress. I mean, th there was a, a, a real sense that that the industry knew that there were more jobs globally in this electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid, you know, hydrogen vehicle, you name it, because we don't want to pick the winners and losers. We just want to say, here's the goal, 54.5, and then 64.5, and then 74.5. We just have to keep late raising the bar. Uh, but by bringing along the industry, well, we, had, uh, we had John Dingle signing off on it out of Michigan. Uh, and that's... That's how we have to. That's it's how we credit, have to. It's a credit to your legislative uh, skill that you brought a lot of those people on board. And, and the same thing was true in 2009 <laughs> with Wax for Markey, as you're saying, because uh, we had to get John Dingle sign off on it, uh, Henry Waxman and I, uh, mm -hmm. and which ultimately he did. Uh, but it was to make sure that those industries that were going to be in transition uh, would in fact, uh, get the resources, have the time frame that they would need in order to uh, make the changes. Uh, and ultimately, you know, despite your heroic work in the Senate, uh, there was just incredible power from Peabody Coal and Arch Coal and all of them. They've all gone bankrupt since. Uh, and I, I've talked to some of them and they wish they had the tens of billions of dollars that we were going to. You're damn give. right. We had billions of dollars to help them. We had $250 <coughs> billion dollars for carbon capture and sequestration, $250 billion in that bill for them. And they might have made a transition, you know, but uh, it's, it's unfortunate that they just didn't step up. Uh, again, people like Rick Boucher from Virginia, he stepped up, he cast the right vote, and uh, they defeated him in the next election. So we have to be mindful of where we are when you look at, John, when you look at the, the clean energy revolution in our country and around um, the globe, I know that you're an optimist about what's unfolding. Can you talk a little bit, give people kind of a, a guide to how far we've come in such a short period of time? Oh, it's incredible, Eddie. I mean, we, you know, solar, for instance, is 10 times cheaper than it was uh, just a few years ago. The rate, the curve, of improvement and discovery uh, is is uh, is staggering. And now, solar. We, we always heard the argument for years. We heard the argument. Well, it's cheaper. It's it's less expensive for our community. We got to be able. You know, we we need to do coal because it's affordable. But today, in fact, the people are realizing that even when you when you don't factor in the real costs, you just take the bare cost of the coal itself. Solar is cheaper now. And, 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 and contracts are being let for solar fields in various communities at three cents a kilowatt hour, 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour. So it is absolutely cheaper than coal, but what the coal industry and, and a counter have never done, which shocks me to this day, is not do real accounting. They would never take into account the residual costs of coal i.e. the air quality, the particulates, the 55 billion we spend every year for our children who are hospitalized in the summer by environmentally induced asthma, which comes from the quality of the air. We have uh, black lung for miners. We have coal sludge, which fills our rivers and streams and lakes and kills fish and is poisonous. I mean, the costs, the true costs have always been much more, but now people are starting to really understand this. Uh, we're seeing, you know, Moore's law with respect to technology cutting in here, 
and every next generation is progressively that much cheaper. So we're at a point now, we're just on the raw cost. Renewables are many of them cheaper, not all of them, but many of them. But if we would do the kind of things that were in the bill that Eddie you know, put forward and that we've been, what we're talking about now, what Joe Biden wants to do is fuel research and development and innovation in our nation and bring other people to the table to do that. The world needs to come together to do joint innovation efforts with a crash effort to produce long battery storage. You know, whoever breaks that code and people are close to doing it is going to solve a huge percentage of the problem. Because if we can get uh, 25 days of battery storage, 30 days, then the baseload challenges for companies that say, well, if the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, what are we going to do when we have to produce our widgets? And the point is the base load is a real challenge. But if you don't have hydro, if you don't have alternative fuels, you don't have nuclear from the residual of nuclear that's there, you got a problem. We have to stopgap that problem to convince people of this alternative. And, and the minute we've done that, you can have a smart grid for America, which by the way, building out the smart grid for our nation is massive numbers of jobs being created. And it will use artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the latest technologies. We can send energy produced on a farm in Iowa or Minnesota to any other part of the country if we do that. We can use Texas's grid. Texas has its own grid. We could build a remarkable amount of wind energy coming out of Oklahoma, out of Nevada, various places where they're blessed to have a lot of wind in the mountains and hills. And already you see massive numbers of wind power turbines churning in those areas. But if we were to join together on a national basis, these new technologies are, are going to provide massive amount of jobs, great quality of life, and frankly, lower the cost for average Americans to be able to have energy to heat their home, drive their electric battery car, and so forth. One of the things Joe Biden's planning to do is, is a huge infrastructure build out to provide some 500,000 charging stations across the country so that people will not be intimidated about the idea of buying an electric car. If you have a long cross country journey, you can actually do it. So the future is in this technology. Uh, there are a lot of simple things you can do, as Eddie knows better than anybody. Uh, the, lo the lowest hanging fruit of managing emissions and reducing our energy is, is, is efficiency. And, and retrofitting buildings and doing things that will save people huge sums of money currently spent on the cost of energy. So we're looking at a revolution that I believe, and Eddie believes this, we're convinced. I have no doubt about it. This is going to be the greatest economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution, and it's going to clean up some of the problems that have been left us by the Industrial Revolution. And I can't wait until we get serious about it and make it happen. Well, you know, I agree with you, John. It, and, you know, I authored the Appliance Efficiency Act of 1987, and that's, air let's just take air conditioning. Air conditioning is 80% of peak demand for electricity in Texas, uh, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in the summer, 80% of peak demand. So just by dint of my law passing, uh, we so dramatically increased the efficiency of air conditioning that it obviated the need for 200 coal burning plants to ever have to be built. So my mother used to say, Eddie, your father and I, were gonna donate your brain to Harvard Medical School as a completely unused human organ. <laughs> and, and then she would say, then she would say, you have to learn how to work smarter and not harder. Well, that's what energy efficiency is. Why would you pay extra for the refrigeration, for the stove, for the air conditioning, for electricity, if the standards were raised? The same thing is true for buildings. It, uh, and I think you're, you're just so right that once we set the standard for doubling or tripling the energy efficiency of new buildings in the United States, using AI and using new materials that have been developed over the last 10 or 15 years, the construction industry will meet those standards very quickly. And so there won't be any sacrifice involved. We'll need people to do the jobs <laughs> out there, 
to construct these buildings, to manufacture the new air conditioning units or the more energy efficient vehicles. But we're talking about millions of jobs. We can save all of creation by engaging in massive job creation. And, uh, and that's, I think that's gonna be the key uh, to this argument. Huh? So can you talk a little bit, I know that in uh, Joe Biden's plan, uh, that he's talked about uh, moving to 100% clean energy, no, net zero by 2035 in the electricity sector. That would have been considered impossible uh, just uh, you know 15 years ago. But we know with all the, the developments, as you've been talking about, that that's now possible. So you, can you talk a little bit about the Biden plan and that 100% that goal by the year 2035? Well, the Biden plan is a reflection of high ambition. Uh, some people doubt 2035, but most, most observers believe that over 15 years with the proper government input and incentive, with the proper structure being created and standards being required, and Eddie's 100% correct. You know, we don't want to be getting into picking the winners and losers. We don't want to play the, 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 the command and control game. What we want to do is, is set uh, neutral standards for clean energy and efficiency. And then people chase those standards. That's the key. And as they chase those standards, money will flow into the, our, the research and the development and innovation necessary to get there, as it always has, uh, because that's what we're good at. I mean, our, you know, whether it's Caltech or Stanford or MIT or, you know, Worcester Polytech or whatever, we have incredible capacity to do research and to, and our entrepreneurs are incredible. One thing America does better than any other country in the world is the allocation of capital. And that's the upside of some capitalism. Some of you may not like that word. And the truth is there's some robber baron capitalism around the world these days, and that has to change. That's part of what Joe Biden wants to change. But allowing people you know, innovative people, smart people, the Elon Musks and the Bill Gateses and the Sergey Brins and Larry Pages and all these people to, to uh, be able to raise money and go out and make something. And by making it, uh, they hire a lot of people and we become the leaders in that technology. That's, that's a great cycle, folks. And that's what we anticipate will happen here. But, but Joe's, Joe, Joe Biden's uh, plan is not just to set the standard for the, for the technology, uh, it's to uh, dramatically expand the demand for certain sectors of, uh, that we need to address with respect to climate. We can't do this just by focusing on power. We have to reduce our emissions almost by, uh, you know, 50% every year for 10 years or so to get where we need to go. And to do that, we have to focus on the greatest sectoral production of emissions. They are uh, power providing, which is about 27%, but then transportation is 27%. Then you've got heavy industry, which is somewhere around 19, 20 some percent, 21 somewhere figures. And uh, you've got agriculture, which is uh, anywhere from nine to 11%. Uh, and you've got, uh, uh, buildings, uh, you know, commercial and residential buildings. These are the biggest components of the matrix of where emissions come from. So we, so Joe Biden is focusing on every single one of them. He's going to try to transition 500,000 school buses, that's our fleet, to electric within about five years. He's going to try and push the, the uh, private sector to transition faster out of internal combustion engine and into electric or zero emissions, doesn't have to be uh, electric per se, it could be hydrogen and other kinds of things. And as, as that demand is set there, that's the goal and the standard, a lot of people are gonna rush in and you're already seeing that. There, there's an increased uh, reflection in boardrooms all around the world, in universities around the world that oil and gas uh, is not the future. Uh, the future is going to be in these new technologies. So I, I, I think the Biden uh, approach, uh, which has, you should go to JoeBiden.com, folks, and just pull up, at, say, slash environment plan or climate plan, 
uh, and uh, you'll get a really good uh, detailed readout longer than we could discuss here in every aspect right now. But it takes leadership. You need to have a president. You need to have a pr president of the Senate. I, I mean, a, 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 a majority leader in the Senate, Speaker of the House, people who really want to make this happen and are prepared to use their convening authority to bring the key players to the table and, you know, kind of jawbone, knock heads a little bit, get the job done. I'm convinced we can hit the 2035 target and maybe sooner. And I think we have to stop talking about 2050. I think we have to start talking about moving faster. Uh, the outside ought to be 2045 or somewhere uh, because we've just not gotten the job done in the last three, four or five years. And uh, we're, we've got a lesser amount of time and an accelerated amount to do. Uh, and I'm for being serious about it and real, as is Eddie, not happy talk at meetings internationally that don't lead to anything. We can't we don't have time for that anymore. Yeah. And, and again, that was the that was kind of the high ambition that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I wanted to include in the Green New Deal, just to kind of lift lift people's gaze, to the constellation of possibilities, you know, in these technologies for our country and for the world. Uh, and that it really wasn't a technological set of obstacles, but political obstacles that was stopping the unleashing of this incredible revolution that you were talking about, unleashing, unleashing entrepreneurs, uh, unleashing tech, technological geniuses to do in the energy sector what they did in the tech sector. And that all happened in the blink of an eye once we broke down the telephone and cable monopolies and we can do the same thing here again. So from my perspective, I, I look at, and I, and I reflect back on what you said earlier, that uh, the United States has to be the leader. You know, you can't preach temperance from a bar stool. You can't tell the rest of the world not to do something when you've got a glass of whiskey in one hand and a cigar in the other. No one is going to do the virtuous thing. So you negotiated the Paris Accord. How important is it for the future of the planet, for the United States, for Donald Trump to be defeated, for us to have a Democratic House and Senate so that we have credibility going around the world so that we can have these other countries, China, India, Brazil, uh, every other country in the world following what we're doing. Well, I think, I mean, you know, the answer to that is life and death to our, to our planet, life and death. I don't, and I don't think I'm being dramatic about that. If we had four more years of Donald Trump, who has moved, he has rolled back over a hundred different environmental rules that pertain to clean air and clean water. And he had the audacity in the debate the other night to stand up and say, well, I want crystal clear air and crystal clear water. Are you kidding me? He's done more to damage the capacity to do that than any single person in my lifetime. And, and, uh, uh, and he lied to the American people about why he was pulling out of Paris. He said it places an undue burden on our economy. Lie, because it doesn't place any burden on our economy. It's an opportunity for American economic leadership. But more importantly, uh, no country wrote a plan in Paris that was going to be a burden to them. And as you know, Eddie, big oil was in Paris. Big nuclear was in Paris. All the major Fortune 500 companies were in Paris. And they all helped to write this with a view to what would leave them being competitive and how they could continue to uh, be able to be uh, viable in the marketplace. So uh, Trump just did this out of spite for you know, Barack Obama and the fact that somebody else did something. And he took an ideological position that is happy talk within some ranks of the Republican Party. But everybody ought to recognize it's not just the climate crisis, which is existential to us. Donald Trump made it crystal clear when he attacked our democracy by claiming that a system that is not, it may have a little you know, challenge here and there, but it is not a fraudulent system. There is no widespread showing, and the FBI even said that, no widespread showing of ballot fraud or fraud in the electoral system. Donald Trump is trying to set up a judicial coup in this country. And so the real fight here in the next 30 plus days is to make sure we win this thing and win it big, big enough that there is no route for a legal challenge. 
There's no doubt about what happens after November 3rd. And everybody has to be part of that. Folks, all of you listening, focus on 2016 for a moment. Of the eligible voters in America in 2016 with Donald Trump on the budget on the ballot, knowing who he was and what, what he is, only 55.6% of Americans came out to vote. And of young people, you know, some of the people who helped fuel Eddie's campaign and people who are at the stalwarts in the climate uh, movement, guess what? Between 18 and 25, only 19% saw fit to come out and vote. So we want to win the future, you got to vote. Our democracy does not work on automatic pilot. And, and, and this time, I believe if everybody will vote, we will win. And you know what, John, we, we focused upon that in our campaign and focusing on the climate crisis, the Green New Deal. We think we doubled the under 35 turnout um, from 2018 to 2020 in Massachusetts. And it was by having this very big vision of what can happen, how we can, how the planet's running a fever. There are no emergency rooms for planets. Uh, and if we do the preventative care, we can create millions of new jobs, union jobs, prevailing wage jobs for people. And so that was the message. And, uh, and it, it pretty much uh, fundamentally, you know, took a whole younger generation and said, well, there's something to fight for. And I know you have an organization you've created, John, uh, World War Zero, uh, that is a part of this election cycle. And it's just very exciting what you're doing uh, as you want to move the, our country and the world towards uh, uh, zero carbon emissions. Can you can you tell people watching right now about World War Zero and uh, what you're doing right now? Well, I mean, I'm delighted to. Uh, World War Zero uh, was founded by a whole group of uh, folks with me. Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California, who did a lot on climate in California. Uh, Chuck Hagel, who was our defense secretary. Bill Cohen, who was our senator from Maine and defense secretary. Uh, Christy Todd Whitman, who was director of the EPA and governor of New Jersey. A whole bunch of folks came together from many different walks of life. We have people from the arts, film, science. Uh, we have the Archbishop of Canterbury. We have two former prime ministers of Britain. We have a lot of different players who come to the table who, who know that no one nation can solve this problem. It has to be done by everybody coming together and who know that uh, we have to change the discussion. And there was a feeling that if, there, if these kinds of unlikely allies, that's the key word to World War Zero, unlikely allies coming together to say, to sort of shake people a bit and say, hey folks, this is real. Don't believe this claptrap, this phony stuff you're hearing about fake news and Chinese hoax. Listen to us. We've been there. We know this is a security risk for the world. We know we can do something about it. And it's called World War Zero because the whole world has to be involved in this. If China, India, and other countries aren't there, we can't get this done. China is about to bring 21 gigawatts of coal-fired power online. That's going to kill us. It's crazy. And when you add India and Malaysia and Indonesia and other countries, that's moving in the wrong direction. So we, we, the world has to come to the table. War, because... Some people have actually declared war on science, war on facts, war on evidence, war on uh, years of modeling and, and, and scientific analysis, and, and, and zero, because that's the goal. We have to get, as we've said earlier today, by 2050, we've got to have a net zero carbon economy. So I hope uh, people will go to our website, worldwarzero.com. Uh, and join up. We're having conversations with Americans now about the importance of voting. And that's really what we're trying to do is help drive environmental voters to the polls. If 70% of Americans really believe climate change is a serious crisis, and they, that's what the polling says, then they alone could win this election and win the future. And that's what I hope people will do. And, and I agree with you, John. We're, we're at, we're at a, uh, a critical historic turning point. If Donald Trump wins a second term, it's the effect of, a, of actually imposing a death sentence on the planet uh, because we will have been off the field for eight years, eight critical years. 
Uh, we will have seen a rollback in fuel economy standards, investment in solar, wind, all those other technologies that you were talking about. And the rest of the world, unfortunately, largely, will also be sitting on the sidelines. So this is, this is the moment for the United States to stand up you know, and to remove the denier in chief from the Oval Office and Mitch McConnell from the majority leadership in the Senate. So we can go back to being uh, the leader, the technological giant on the planet to show that we can create jobs uh, while reducing the threat, uh, create more wealth, um, but also ensure that the rest of the world see, has these technologies made available to them as well. And, uh, and so for me, John, just to have you on, just such an incredible historic leader on these uh, issues is just, uh, it just means the world to me and everyone who's watching right now, you know, we're so grateful for your leadership and, uh, and looking forward to your leadership uh, in the future as well, because I think uh, your role is going to become uh, greatly enhanced in the very near future so that you can uh, provide the vision for what our country and our planet needs. Well, Eddie, thank you for very, very generous comments. I, I don't, I don't think anybody knows what the future holds, but I'll tell you, uh, you just hit the nail on the head. We don't win this one. I, I don't know what we do, honestly. I, I would be at a little, I mean, we could resist, we'd go out the street, we could do things, but uh, I gotta tell you, the planet is not gonna advance at this pace and rate that it needs to, to get this job done. So everybody, we got 30 whatever days it is, and every day has got to be used to its fullest to get people out there. Anybody who saw that debate last night, my God, that was such a black-eyed disgrace for our nation. And people all over the world are scratching their heads as with all that. That man was disgusting, and he has been over the course of these four years. Uh, and, and um, you know, we have this privilege of voting. Please use it. And you know what, John? I was able to get 30, 36 of my colleagues in the Senate to write a, a letter to the uh, Debates Commission to say, why are you excluding climate from the first debate? So we had 11 minutes on climate on the first debate. There wasn't one question in 2016 asked of Hillary uh, Trump about climate. So I think that this problem is getting solved, but we needed to play a larger role in this debate because I but, think- it's But Joe Biden, but, but Eddie, you hit a point. Joe Biden, is the first person, I think, who, who has put together the climate and economic component. And because of COVID-19, President Biden will face issues and challenges as great as Franklin Roosevelt did in the Great Depression. And to have climate be a critical component of that recovery is the way we're going to get the infrastructure built and the things we need to do. So we have an unparalleled opportunity here. And uh, nobody, nobody, nobody gets a free pass. No hall passes, folks. Yeah, every, everyone's in. It's it's all hands on deck. The Franklin Roosevelt had the Civilian Conservation Corps. We need this uh, Climate Conservation Corps that's created. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and young people, I think, will rally uh, to this cause all across the country. And uh, and uh, just uh, you know, on the shoulders, however, the great work that you have done in the past. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Good to be with you, my friend. Oh, you're great. Again, congratulations, but keep working. Oh, yeah. There's, no, there's, uh, I, I have a Republican. By the way, everyone watching, I have a Republican, uh, Kevin O'Connor. Uh, I'm going to be debating him on WGBH Channel 2 on Monday night, Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. So I'll be debating him for an hour. So uh, please tune in. Uh, he says he wants to uh, debate climate. Well, so don't I. So I'm looking forward uh, to having a discussion with him about that right. subject. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm still out there campaigning every day. Only the paranoid survive. So I'm just going to keep going. Uh, just uh, pocket what we just won. But uh, we have to make it through November 3rd and help Joe Biden. Have, Teddy, uh, thanks for what you're doing. Appreciate Thank it. John, thanks for everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John.